Good morning. It is Easter Sunday and it seemed very appropriate that I be out here in springtime in the early morning just like the two Marys were to talk about Jesus rising from the dead. It's a really it's a really awesome day. Um, it's a really awesome time with all the unpredictable stuff going on but you know, every year there's unpredictable stuff going on, right? How, how is this Easter? I mean, I know this Easter is different than others, but um, for some people, it's just the same, right? Well, Jesus knew how his Easter would be. He knew how his Easter would be, and this week, I've just been reading through the Gospels and celebrating Holy Week by looking over the whole life of Jesus, and it's kind of been like, um, you know how at a funeral they show the slideshow of all the pictures of the people over the years and or in the movies when the hero when the hero dies they show like a montage of all these great things the hero did reading through the Gospels this week has been kind of like that just falling in love with Jesus and seeing how awesome he is and the things that he taught and the things that he did and something that really stuck out of course because of Easter, is how many times Jesus said that he was gonna die and raise from the dead. He told his disciples that over and over. He said it multiple times. And so I'm gonna give, we're, we're gonna look at some of those and um, look at what Jesus thought about Easter before Easter, right? So we'll start in Mark 8. We'll see if I have to run in because of the rain. Mark 8, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. He strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So they go to Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi is, um, it's filthy. It's a terrible place. It's worse than Las Vegas. It's worse than New Orleans during Mardi Gras. It is just uh, full of wickedness and evil. There's all kinds of, of uh, idols and false gods and, and these disgusting sacrifices and these disgusting practices. Um, it's there where they had this place that was Jewish people, by slang, called it the gates of hell because it was just such a wicked place. And um, so Jesus takes the disciples there. Um, and in that context, is like, who do you guys say that I am? Who do people say I am? And it's obviously in comparison with all these false gods. And when Peter says you're the Christ, he is really proclaiming something. He is really saying... All these things are fake. You're the real deal, Jesus. And uh, and Jesus says, you know, Peter, this wasn't revealed to you by man. This is divine revelation that you have. And divine, this this is what we're going to build the church on. Um, and he strictly charged him, told him, don't tell anybody. And then it says the very next verse, Mark eight thirty one. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And so they've just seen all this pagan nonsense. They've confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God the savior of the world that they've heard about all their lives that they've hoped for for forever. And then he says he's gonna be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. Now that doesn't make sense because the elders and the chief priests and the scribes are living for Yahweh and they are quoting all the prophets and they're gonna reject him. And then he's gonna be killed and that doesn't make any sense at all. 
for for the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior to be killed, and then after three days rise again, I don't even think they got that far. I don't even think that made it into their minds. Um, some of them got hung up that he was going to be rejected because they, they these were Jewish guys. They respected the scribes. They respected the Pharisees. They wanted, if they wanted to draw near to God, they wanted to listen to what they had to say. So to be rejected by them would be just messed up, but killed and then three days later rise again after being killed? People don't come back from the dead. He said this plainly, it says in Mark 8, 32. This isn't a parable. This was not a riddle. Um, you know, Jesus spoke in a lot of parables, not this time. He said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That little phrase is such a great kind of thesis statement of Jesus. Setting your mind on the things of God, not on the things of man. That's what Jesus was doing his whole life. Everything he did was setting his mind on the things of God, obeying the Father. What does the Father want? He, he said at the Last Supper, everything that the Father told me, I've told you. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't keep anything hidden. And he rebukes Peter for the opposite. Then he calls the crowd together and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That is the most despicable, shameful way to die. Take up his cross. Anybody wants to follow me, just assume that you're going to die a shameful, embarrassing death and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Remember, Jesus got tempted in the wilderness and the devil offered him the whole world. The whole world will bow down to you if you just bow down to me, the devil said. Jesus has been tempted with this very thing and learned from the Father, gotten consolation from the Father, gotten instruction and encouragement from God the Father, and then he passes on that same kind of encouragement. What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What does it profit a man at all to do that? What can a man give in return for his soul? But whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. That was encouragement to Jesus. You're gonna suffer, you're gonna be rejected, you're gonna be killed, but in the third day, you're gonna rise from the dead and you'll never, you'll be undiable. You'll, you'll, you'll never die again. So Jesus gives that same encouragement to the disciples that God the Father has already given to him, that he's already learned from. The last part of that, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This whole, uh, he's coming in the glory of his Father with the holy angels is about judgment. That's about some judgment is going to happen. And there they are, Caesarea Philippi, all these pagans doing all this horrible stuff. And Jesus says, um, you guys are right to align with me and to believe in me because when I come in the glory of my Father with the holy angels, judgment is going to come. And it's going to come on all these pagans doing these terrible, wicked things. So Jesus, he knows about the suffering. He knows that it's about obedience and, and it's about following the Father. He also knows he's going to raise from the dead and that in all of that, there is a judgment. There's a, a, a judgment to that. Let's go to Matthew 17. They're heading to Galilee. Matthew 17, 22. Galilee is way north of Jerusalem. 
Um, but they are going there first, then they'll go back down to Jerusalem. He says, as they are gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Jesus, again, saying it plainly to them, he's going to be delivered into the hands of men. He's going to get arrested. They're going to kill him. It's not just going to be uh, uncomfortable. It's not going to be a rough time. He's going to die. And then on the third day, he's going to raise from the dead. He's going to beat that. He's going to rise up over that. Now to John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled. So Jesus, he's with all the disciples, but he's troubled. And he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. See, Jesus knew that he was sent by God to teach. He knew he was sent by God to heal and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, that sins were forgiven. But look at this. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. He also knew that he was sent to die. He knew that he was sent to suffer, to, to be rejected, uh, to be crucified, and to die. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. So there was a sound, and people heard it. And it was up to them to talk through what was that. Uh, some said it was thunder. Some said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake and not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus is saying, that voice from heaven was for you to help you believe that what I'm saying is true. It was uh, some evidence. It was some backing. And judgment. What? Voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. So again, there's something about Jesus dying and raising from the dead that also involves judgment. Then he says in 1232, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. He doesn't just know in some vague way that he's going to get martyred. He knows that he's going to get crucified. And something about the way he said that, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. The crowd answers, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Some slang or idiom or uh, expression that he said in that being lifted up, they knew that meant crucified. And they know from the prophets and from Moses that the Christ is going to live forever. That the, the Son of Man, the Son of David, will not die and, and will be eternal life. And so when he says he's going to be lifted up, they're, they're all confused. Um, but they recognize it. And that recognizes Jesus knew exactly how he was going to die. He knew what he was going to have to go through the whole bit. Look, look at this. Um, he really knew the details of what he was going to go through. In Matthew 20, 17, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. So now they're on their way to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way, he says, Okay, guys, look, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Wow. She's saying, we're going to go into this town, and here's what's going to happen. And he's not saying it like, look out, be careful, we can't let this happen. He's saying, here's what's going to happen when we get to Jerusalem. <clears throat> They're going to arrest him, condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. 
Now that is bad news. Hold on. <coughs> it's bad news to be turned over to the Gentiles because the Jews, they had a limit to the laws that they could enforce. Um, like when Stephen gets stoned, that was illegal. That was a, a crime. That was vigilante justice. That wasn't, that wasn't legal. And uh, so for Jesus to be condemned by the, the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes and deliver him over to the Gentiles means this is going to be bad. This is going to be terrible. He says he's going to be mocked and flogged and crucified and raised on the third day mocked and flogged and crucified so mockery you don't know what that means it's going to be some kind of you know mock i mean it's terrible right flogged they knew what that meant they knew what a roman flogging was if you got flogged by the jewish leaders um, the law said you could only be you could only whip a man 40 times otherwise you'd bring disgrace upon him and so they would have somebody that would count and they would uh, whip a guy 39 times because they didn't want to accidentally go over and break the law and then they would confer are you sure you counted right you didn't lose count yeah you we've only whipped him 39 times yeah you're positive yeah and then they give him one more to make sure he got his 40 but didn't go over the Romans weren't so nice they just whipped you and whipped you and whipped you they flogged uh, a lot of people just died from the flogging so Jesus knows I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be flogged, and then I'm going to be crucified. And he'll be raised on the third day. So just think about that for a minute. Like, if you think about some, you know, I'm going to go through this bad thing, but at the end it'll be all right. Because Jesus knew the depth of everything he was going to go through. He was going to get mocked and flogged and crucified and be raised on the third day. Jesus knew as awful as being rejected by the scribes and the priests, as awful as that would be, as awful as it would be to be turned over to the Romans for mockery and flogging and crucifixion, that the power of God was gonna beat that. That the might and the love and the zeal of God would overwhelm even those things that even a flogging even crucifixion even mockery would not stand a chance and after three days he would be alive forever wow well then just days before the Passover Jesus is teaching the disciples this is after Palm Sunday and he's teaching about, uh, it's Matthew 25, and you're familiar with Matthew 25. It's the whole passage where Jesus is talking about judgment. And he's talking about the sheep and the goats. And the, God's going to come and separate them. And on this side, he's going to say, um, you know, come enter my, my father's delight. And you are accursed. And you're, oh, well, I'll just read it. Um, Matthew 25, this is the end of it. 25:44 They will answer, "Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we didn't minister to you?" Then he will answer them saying, "Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me." And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know, in two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. There it is. The context is judgment and who chose the right path. And in the context of judgment and separation of good and evil, Jesus says, in two days, the Passover is coming, and I, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to be crucified. Again, 
It's come up several times. But when Jesus teaches about him being crucified and rising from the dead, it's in the context of judgment. Caesarea Philippi, all these false gods, who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm going to suffer. Wow. So finally, right there, during the trial, face to face with the high priest, Jesus has been in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying all night, um, in distress, crying out to God for a different way, and resolving to do God's will. <clears throat> He's arrested, taken in, court after court. They're all make-believe. They're all stupid. And um, all these people are bringing charges against Jesus, but none of their stories line up. Nobody can... can say that they saw the same thing or testify against him or bring charges against him that make any sense at all. So the high priest stands up <clears throat> and he says, don't you have any answer? Don't you have anything to say? What is it that these men testify against you? Like, none of these people have a good case. Why should you be arrested? <laughs> That's what they're asking Jesus. I mean, they're so... They, they, they are so corrupt and they have so nothing to do uh, that they're asking Jesus, tell us why we should convict you. We don't have a good enough story. But Jesus remained silent. Jesus isn't talking to them. He knows they're not listening. Uh, he's not going to waste his breath. He's not going to waste his time. And um, it says in you know Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to slaughter that doesn't cry out, um, like a, like a sheep to the slaughter. Jesus didn't try to defend himself. Remember, this is part of his ministry. This is for this moment, for this hour, he has come. He has been prepared for this. So the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So now it gets complicated. When that high priest says, I adjure you by the living God, we can read that, and it sounds like he's like, Come on, I swear, tell me who you are. It's not like that. Um, this is actually specific legal language that the high priest uses. And under their law, if the high priest invoked this, this demand upon you, you had to answer. So it's not like we have the Fifth Amendment and you can, you know, be quiet or whatever. Um, you had to answer this question. And so you have Jesus without sin, knows that nobody's going to listen to him, knows that he's the Christ, the chosen one of God, is going to obey the law. The high priest invokes that law to say, you have to say who you are. Tell us, it, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And it's almost this moment where it's like Jesus is like, all right, you asked for it. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on. So, so Jesus puts it back on him. He's like, you have said it. You have said that I am. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. I'm telling you, from now on, you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of power, sitting in the glory of God, beside God, equal to God, coming on the clouds of heaven. This is coming in glory coming in judgment that's what that insinuates so do you see all of a sudden Jesus is talking about judgment and he has flipped it on the high priest who is judging him and condemning him and Jesus is saying mockery uh, scourge flogging crucifixion death all of that is going to stand in judgment 
and in three days Jesus is going to be raised from the dead and that that false judgment that that false condemnation that they brought against God the, that they brought against Jesus the Christ the Son of the Living God that is going to be judged and that is going to be condemned he says, I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? Well, of course, um, that was blasphemy or it was true. It was blasphemy for Jesus to say he was equal to God. It was blasphemy for Jesus to say that he would come in judgment of them unless it's true and Jesus knew it he knew he was going to go through it he tried to get hope in the disciples and to prepare them and now we know how the story ends that it's true and so the things that Jesus said about it we can trust will also be true the coming judgment the uh, the the life forevermore the promise to enter into his kingdom with him and to never die. All of that was proved when Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's why we celebrate Easter. That it says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross and scorned its shame. If I scorn something, ah, I don't like it. Ah, I, you know, it has no power. I, I despise it. That's what Jesus did to the shame of the cross, the shame and embarrassment of that false judgment that would prove out to be wrong. For the joy set before him, that joy was dying for your sins. That joy was the promise and the hope that he can put in you, that he can give you, that you will be with him for eternity. That when we call on the name of the living God, it says in Romans, we will be saved. And the resurrection that was his is the resurrection that will also be ours. That we will be raised with him on that last day. And so, celebrate Jesus today. Celebrate him who knew every single thing was going to happen and obeyed the Father for our sakes and rose from the dead so that we would all have everlasting life in him. God bless you.